Hey everyone, today I want to share with you my very first public debate. So I did one engagement before this. It was kind of a tag team debate with some college students. I don't know where the footage for that is. If I ever find it, I'll share it with you. But this is my very first solo one-on-one -on -one public debate. It took place in 2012 at the University of New Mexico. A group there called Catholic Apologetics, Catholic Apologetics Fellowship and Evangelization. Cafe is the name of the club. They set up the debate with the local Freedom From Religion Foundation. And the Freedom From Religion Foundation had a local representative, Jim Travis, take part in the debate. And so we were debating, does God exist? So it's it's a blast from the past to be able to see this. Uh, I've done over a dozen debates since then. Debates are one of my favorite things to do as an apologist. I think it's a great way to invite people who are not Catholic to look at Catholicism, Christianity, the existence of God, and really weigh the issues for themselves. So I've learned a lot since doing this. It's funny going back and watching this. There's obviously some things that I would you know, do differently here and there. But overall, I feel very blessed that God has um, called me to do this. And I'm looking forward to doing more public dialogues and public debates. So if you like what we do here, if you want to support us to help us do more debates, more public dialogues, be sure to visit TrentHornPodcast.com to support what we're doing. And so now, without further ado, here is my very first public debate, Does God Exist? Check it out. Um, I, let me start by introducing our debaters. For the affirmative on whether God exists, we've got Trent Horn. Trent holds a master's degree in theology from the Franciscan University of Steubenville and serves as coordinator of Respect Life Parish Leadership Support for the Roman Catholic Diocese of Phoenix. He specializes in training pro-lifers to intelligently and compassionately engage pro-choice advocates in genuine dialogue. He's also completing his first book entitled The Catholic Guide to Answering Atheism. Trent currently resides in Phoenix and is preparing to marry his fiancée, Laura, in May. Over here on the negative side is Jim Travis. Jim is an atheist and self-taught philosopher who has read widely and studied a number of religious debates on this topic, including the works of Richard Dawkins, Christopher Hitchens, Sam Harris, and Dan Barker. Jim is very analytical and has discussed these issues with friends and family for many years. He's worked in the construction industry and as a laser electro-octop electro-optic technician on high-precision positioning mechanical and software systems in the semiconductor industry. So the debate is going to proceed in a fairly standard format, and we're going to start with Trent with the affirmative opening speech. Right. Can everyone hear me back there? All right. Barely? Let's give someone give me a little boost in the audio. Well, first, I'd like to thank the Cafe Club and as well as the Secular Student Alliance and the Albuquerque Humanists for sponsoring such an important event. And I'd like to thank Jim for his willingness to participate in this debate. In the past, I've asked atheists what would convince them that God exists. Many say a miracle, like the healing of an amputee, would do the trick quite nicely. But the problem with this kind of evidence is that even advanced technology or aliens could perform what we think are miracles. If this is what we call evidence, then we might start worshiping the crew of the Star Trek Enterprise if they turned out to be real. Instead, we should use philosophical arguments that examine the universe as a whole in order to see if God exists. Now, some of you may be skeptical. How could these simple arguments prove such a radical conclusion like the existence of God? Well, philosophers use simple arguments to demonstrate many things that we would think are radical. So this is nothing new to philosophy. With that in mind, I will present four arguments for the existence of God, who we can define as a necessarily existing eternal creator who is the source of perfect goodness. My first argument concerns the existence of the universe. For a long time, scientists and philosophers thought the universe was eternal. But a Belgian priest named Father Georges Lemaitre discovered that if Einstein was correct, then the universe could not be eternal. This is because gravity should cause an eternal universe to collapse. But Einstein's theories would work if the universe were not eternal. Einstein was skeptical at first, but by 1933, he said that Father Lemaitre's theory of cosmic origins was the most beautiful he had ever heard. Although not every scientist agreed. The British physicist Fred Hoyle thought it was just religious propaganda, and he called it the Big Bang Theory as kind of a joke. Well, the joke is on Hoyle, because the Big Bang is now one of the be best attested theories in cosmology. 
The universe's beginning makes up my first argument for God's existence, which is called the Kalam cosmological argument. This argument is currently defended by the philosopher William Lane Craig and proceeds as follows. Everything that begins to exist has a cause. The universe began to exist. Therefore, the universe has a cause. The first premise is confirmed in our everyday experience. Remember when I said that the healing of an amputee would convince some people that God exists? Well, we should ask, why is that impressive? We only think this kind of healing where a limb pops into being from nothing is a miracle because we already believe that something cannot come from nothing without a cause. So if the universe came from nothing, it too must have a cause. The fact that the universe began to exist is confirmed by three lines of evidence. First, if the universe has existed forever, then there would have been an infinite number of days or temporal events before today. But if that were true, then time would have to go through an infinite number of days before today happened. But think about that. When time reaches yesterday, and that's day number infinity, what does that make today? Day number infinity plus one? If the past is infinite, then time can never reach the present moment, and today would never happen. But today did happen. Therefore, we can conclude, as St. Bonaventure concluded in the 13th century, that the universe had a finite past and a beginning in time. Second, entropy will increase in the universe until it reaches a dark, lifeless state known as heat death. Entropy just means disorder, and it is a law of physics that everything tends towards disorder. That's why it's easier to keep your house dirty than it is to keep it clean. The universe is the same way. Eventually, all the stars will burn out, and the universe will be a cold, dark, and lifeless place. But if the universe were eternal, then heat death would have already occurred, and nothing would exist. But since something does exist, then the universe's past must not be eternal, and therefore the universe began to exist. Third, as I said before, the Big Bang has been confirmed by numerous observations in astronomy since the 1920s. In 2003, cosmologists Arvind Bord, Alexander Vilenkin, and Alan Guth published a theorem which shows that with rare exception, any universe that is on average in a state of expansion must have an absolute beginning in time. In a 2012 article, Vilenkin says that all the evidence we have says that the universe had a beginning. Now, if all time, matter, space, and energy have a cause, then the cause of these things must be immaterial in order to create space, eternal and timeless in order to create time, and very powerful, if not all-powerful, in order to create something from nothing. Finally, if the cause of the universe were just an impersonal force, then this force could not choose to make a non-eternal universe. Therefore, the cause of the universe, while eternal and timeless itself, must be a person or mind that chose to make a finite universe. We normally call this immaterial, eternal, powerful mind God. The mind, this mind must also be very intelligent because our universe seems to be the product of design. Now, some atheists will say that evolution explains life, so God isn't needed. And I actually agree that life did evolve. But the odds of us being in a universe where life could even evolve at all are astronomically low. Consider this argument. The universe possesses finely tuned constants and conditions necessary for life to exist. This fine tuning is either due to necessity, chance, or design. The fine tuning was not due to, to chance or necessity. Therefore, the fine tuning of the universe is the work of a designer. Constants are the unchanging numbers in physics, like the constant C in E equals MC squared. These constants came into existence right after the Big Bang, and they must be set with incredible precision in order to have a universe with intelligent life. For example, the cosmological constant represents the strength of gravity found in an empty vacuum. While once thought to be zero, it is strangely fine-tuned to the 120th power. Conditions are things like the amount of matter and order at the beginning of the universe. The Oxford physicist Roger Penrose says that the odds of our universe would start off with low disorder, we have a clean room, so to speak, for our universe, 
that is necessary for life to evolve are 1 in 10 to the 10 to the 123rd power. This double exponent is so big, if I wrote out the zeros, they would fill up the Milky Way galaxy. It is much, much more likely that our universe should be a super condensed ball of matter or a thin mist of hydrogen gas instead of a universe with complex life in it. Atheist Lawrence Krauss, in his book, A Universe from Nothing, admits that this fine-tuning is the most profound, unsolved fundamental problem in physics today. So what explains this fine-tuning? Richard Dawkins, in his book, The God Delusion, rejects the idea that the universe had to be this way, or is necessarily fine-tuned for intelligent life, because it's just too much of a coincidence. But what about chance? I think chance is a really bad explanation, and here's why. Imagine you're playing poker, and one of the other players in your game gets 10 royal flushes in a row. Do you think that player is cheating? You probably think he's cheating because the odds of getting such a collection of hands are astronomically low. The odds are 1 in 10 to the 50th power. But the odds of getting just the cosmological constant right are 1 in 10 to the 120th power. And don't forget about that huge number I told you about connected to the entropy in our universe. If you think the poker game with 10 royal flushes is rigged by a cheating player, then you should think our universe, which is even more improbable, is rigged by a cosmic designer. My third argument is a moral argument for the existence of God, and it proceeds as follows. There exist moral facts. These moral facts have either a natural or a supernatural origin. Natural origins are insufficient to explain moral facts. Therefore, moral facts have a supernatural origin. What do I mean when I say there are moral facts? This is what I mean. I would just ask everyone here, is it a fact that it's wrong to torture children for fun? Isn't it a fact and not an opinion but a fact that it's wrong to rape women. When we say these things are objectively wrong or are facts, we mean that people who think these actions are right are as mistaken as the person who thinks the earth is flat. Furthermore, more than half of professional philosophers, most of whom are atheists, agree that moral facts exist. Now we have to ask, where do these moral facts come from? Are they natural or supernatural? If morality simply evolved among humans, then acting moral may be useful. But then again, fertilizer is useful for growing corn. But it's not morally good to use fertilizer. So there must be a standard for moral goodness beyond mere usefulness. After all, a culture that drowns moderately disabled infants may actually be doing something very useful when it comes to promoting genetic fitness but it wouldn't be moral. Now, let me be clear. Atheists can and do follow individual and cultural codes of morality, sometimes better than Christians. But these codes must simply assume that it is a fact that we should be moral. They have no basis in nature or human opinion to say that such facts are objectively true. But the theist can ground morality in God's perfect nature. In fact, atheistic philosopher J.L. Mackey says that moral facts are so weird that it's extremely unlikely they would exist unless there was an all-powerful God to create them. In response to this, Mackey says that we should give up objective morality and be atheists. I say we should give up atheism and embrace objective morality. My final argument concerns the resurrection of Jesus of Nazareth. The ancient historians Josephus and Tacitus, writing within 100 years of Jesus' death, testify that he was a real historical person. So the question is, what happened to Jesus? If Jesus rose from the dead, then this confirms his divine identity and would be good evidence that God exists. Now, I'm not going to argue that Jesus rose from the dead because the Bible says so. I'm going to take an approach used by scholars like Gary Habermas, and for the sake of the argument, take the New Testament as a set of ordinary historical documents. Under this view, there may be both true and false things in the Bible, and we can use historical criteria to find out what really happened to Jesus. 
Using this historical criterion, we can establish a set of minimal facts that I believe are best explained by Jesus' resurrection. First, Jesus died, was buried, and his tomb was discovered empty by some of his women followers. There is no alternative burial tradition for Jesus, and the early accounts we have lack legendary embellishment. They just read as simple accounts of something that isn't very extraordinary, that a man who died was buried. In addition, the embarrassing fact of women discovering the empty tomb counts in favor of the event's authenticity. If the empty tomb were fictional, Mark would have never described women finding it, because in the first century, women's testimonies were not trusted. For example, the Talmud, which is a collection of ancient Jewish wisdom, says that the testimony of a woman should be treated in the same way one treats the testimony of a criminal. Finally, the tomb was in Jerusalem, where Jewish and Roman authorities could have retrieved Jesus' body and disproved the apostles' resurrection claims. All these facts provide good evidence that Jesus' tomb was indeed found empty on that first Easter morning. Second, even most skeptical scholars admit the disciples had some kind of experience where they believed they saw Jesus raised from the dead. This information comes directly from the Apostle Paul in his first letter to the Corinthians, a letter that no serious historian doubts was indeed written by Paul. What makes Paul's testimony remarkable is that as a Jewish leader, he used to kill and persecute Christians. However, he converted after an encounter with the resurrected Jesus and was even willing to die for the Christian faith. And Paul was not alone. Jesus' half-brother James also converted, who was a skeptic. Some people say that the disciples simply hallucinated their encounters with the post-resurrection Jesus. But a hallucination is not an adequate explanation for these appearances because Jesus appeared to groups of people in a variety of circumstances, and group hallucinations of the same object are almost unheard of. Also, a hallucination would not explain the conversion of skeptics like Paul or James, and it would not explain Jesus' empty tomb. Even if the apostles had hallucinated, they would have imagined that Jesus was in heaven with the heroes of Israel and had not resurrected prior to the end of the world. Such a belief was simply unheard of in the first century. Jesus' resurrection was not something to just believe on a whim, and if it were false, these men would not have gone to painful deaths for it. I contend that Jesus' resurrection is the best explanation for his empty tomb, the appearances to the disciples, the conversion of skeptics, and if Jesus did rise from the dead, then the God who raised Jesus almost certainly exists. Finally, I would like to make it clear that in order to make the case that God does not exist, Jim will have to show that all four of these arguments fail to establish the existence of God. However, even if he did that, it would not be enough to show that atheism is true. After all, even if someone debunked all the evidence for complex life on Mars, uh, it would not follow that there is no complex life on Mars. We would just have to be agnostic to the question. Likewise, in order to defend atheism or the non-existence of God, Jim must show that there are both no good reasons to believe that God exists and there are good reasons to believe atheism is true. If that challenge cannot be met, I contend that the rational person is justified in believing that God exists. Thank you. That was a lot of numbers there. <laughs> I didn't bring my calculator. First of all, thank you all for coming tonight. In the interest of time, I just want to thank everybody who had any hand in putting this together. It uh, came about pretty quickly and uh, looks like a great turnout. Tonight's subject, does God exist? Since I'm not a politician, I can give you a direct answer to that question. The answer is a resounding yes, God does exist. This in the minds of human beings and only in the minds of human beings. To uh, demonstrate that, I'm going to take you on a quick thought experiment. I want you to think of the world, the universe, as it is right now. 
Everything you know is exactly as it is right now. Galaxies are spinning and swirling through the vast emptiness of space, some crashing into each other, enormous gas clouds forming, condensing, coalescing to form stars, solar systems, planets. Here we are on this planet. Think of this world right now as it is right now, except for one thing. Human beings do not exist. We were not created by God, and we did not, or we did not evolve. So everything else is the same. Birds fly, clouds form, rain falls, fish swim in the great oceans, thunder, lightning, but no human beings. I have one question. Where is God in this world? Do the animals gather in a clearing in the forest once a year to discuss the origin of their existence? Do the fish, the lobster, the whales, the dolphins congregate around coral reefs and discuss the, why they're here? Of course not. Again, where is God in this world? Without the human mind, the human brain, nowhere else do we find the slightest idea of God. Okay, so I'm going to snap my fingers and we're all back here now. We're, we're created, we've evolved, we're here. <clears throat> One more thing. Except for maybe the last 100,000 years, and I'm being generous there, this thought experiment is exactly the way the universe was for billions of years. No humans, no God. What I'm going to try to do tonight is present in the short time that we have some of the most current research that shows why the brain is so susceptible to belief in gods. For those interested in more on this subject, I want to direct you to a video on YouTube called Why We Believe in Gods by a scientist named Andy Thompson. He's a psychiatrist in Charlottesville, Virginia, and I'll be borrowing heavily from his video tonight along with a few other sources. Now, we have many cognitive mechanisms that are relevant to tonight's subject, but I'm only going to be talking about a few that are relevant to tonight's subject. First, we do seem to have a sense that there is a being or beings greater than us. This can be easily explained. Reflect for a moment on our earliest times as hominids on the African savanna. Every moment we were in danger of becoming a meal for any number of predators who are faster than us, stronger than us, and more powerful. This constant struggle to stay alive kept us on alert all the time, giving us a cognitive mechanism, a physical brain function called hyperactive agency detection. Everybody's had the experience walking down a dark street at night. Somebody turns the corner, they start coming towards you. All of a sudden, you're hyper aware of that person. Is that person a danger to me? Car, you cross the street, you get in your car, and you're safe. That's hyperactive agency detection. The movement off to the side, you're immediately aware of that. Is that a snake? Is it a rat? Is it a danger to me? Hyperactive agency detection is a, a naturally selected brain function. That's it has developed through natural selection over millions of years. And it leads directly to a belief in a higher being because we are always hyper aware of something or someone out there or something or someone watching us. We have this constant feeling of a supernatural mind watching out every move. A second cognitive mechanism that has developed over eons is called kin psychology. And it is another naturally selected mechanism that is and was essential for our survival. Our ability to recognize our kin, mother and father, extremely important for any being to survive, to run to for protection. This is clearly utilized by religion to indoctrinate us into belief in gods by using familiar family-type relationships. Everyone here knows that the strongest bonds we can develop are the relationships to our family, mainly mother and father. As helpless children, we turn toward our main protectors, father and mother. Look at the terms that are used in religion 
such as the Pope is the Holy Father. Priests, yes, Father, no Father. How about Mother Superior? Nuns are sisters, and we have Franciscan brothers. Religion utilizes this intense natural attachment to our family. In addition, this longing for our parents is identical with our need for protection against the world. And this need for protection and safety, either through our parents or through larger groups, is precisely the formation of religion and gods in our brains. I want to read a quote from a book called Good Without God by Greg Epstein, Good Without God. Quote, one of the first things we learn is to cry out to those seemingly omnipotent beings surrounding us, our parents, or whatever biological or surrogate beings we, family we have. And in the most primitive form of communication, we cry, uh, wah! That means help me. Eventually, we discover that certain ways of crying out make help more or less likely. So we begin to modify and regulate our requests. But we will never be sure that we receive the help we crave. This set of emotions, once we gain language and some theological training, becomes formal petitionary prayer. OK, so one more brain mechanism is called projection. And many of you are familiar with that term. This is when we project emotions and feelings onto others. There are re various reasons, but again, I'm going to just stick to tonight's topic. As early humans developed into larger groups, civilization appeared. Civilization is a construct for providing defense against the terrors of the natural world, natural disasters, disease, other humans, and of course, predators. It's much easier to recover from an earthquake or flood if we have others to help us. Likewise, if we have help when we're sick, we can survive disease and accidents. We tend to humanize the natural world by superimposing known human attributes onto these natural phenomena, anthropomorphism. We originally thought of these things as supernatural. In this way, we create the illusion of control over our powerlessness in order to gain some measure of protection and comfort. Simply said, we turn these powerful forces into so-called gods by projecting our emotions and feelings and attributes onto them. The Old Testament is full of this kind of talk. One example is God sending the flood to punish mankind. The Bible is rife with these human qualities attributed to God. Human qualities attributed to God. Now the last cognitive mechanism I hope I have time for is theory of mind. Theory of mind is the idea that we can intuit the existence of other people's minds. Since we cannot directly experience a mind other than our own, we have evolved the cognitive ability to predict other people's behavior and intentions because we have the same feelings, desires, and intentions. This ability is essential not just for survival, but for all complicated social interactions, which is one of the traits that sets human beings apart. It is a specific cognitive ability to understand others as intentional agents. Brain scan research shows that the same regions light up when people are presented with statements about God and religion as when they are presented with situations concerning, in, concerning interpreting other people's intentions. Same regions light up when thinking about God or when thinking about, well, what is that person thinking? This data comes out of a study by the National Institutes of Health. And here is a direct quote from it. These results demonstrate that specific components of religious belief are processed using well-known brain mechanisms and support psychological theories that show religious belief is grounded in evolutionary, adaptive, cognitive functions. Evolutionary, adaptive, cognitive functions. I'll give you a couple of examples of this. God is a jealous God, a vengeful God. God wants us to worship him, obey him, when we do these things. These are direct examples of theory of mind. 
We are intuiting that God has intention, that he wants, that he needs. But the description of God is that he's all-knowing, all-powerful, omnipotent. Why does a God with this infinite amount of power have these purely human attributes, these human faults, you might even say? You have to say to yourself, something doesn't add up there. In addition to the few brain functions I've mentioned so far, there are many more that are used by religion to instill and maintain belief in supernatural entities. Also, many human attributes such as a sense of fairness, a sense of right and wrong, an ability to cooperate with one another, these attributes are clearly found in other primates. Chimpanzees, bonobos, and some monkeys show these traits, as well as mammals and even insects. Here is a quote from a study by Jessica Flack and Franz de Waal. These are primatologists. Franz de Waal has been studying primates for 50 years. Quote, animals, including chimpanzees, have not evolved moral systems anywhere near the level of ours, but they do show some of the behavioral capacities that are built into our moral systems. Building blocks of morality are not behaviors that are good or nice, but rather mental and social capacities that permit the construction of societies in which shared values constrain individual behavior through a system of approval and disapproval, not some objective moral thing that's hung out there in the ether. This is a better explanation for moral reality than we see in the world around us, than to posit that some supernatural being just created moral, moral, correct moral behavior. In fact, studies by Jesse Baring, a professor of psychology at Wells College, shows that six-month-old human infants exhibit a distinct moral sense when presented with situations that demonstrate moral, good or bad behavior. This is long before a child is exposed to the Bible or the concept of God or any other moral, <clears throat> moral instruction. The hardwired, evolved brain function. And there is no evidence that God gave us these traits when he created us so that we could then seek him out. These are evol- all the evidence is in the other direction. These are, evolution- these are the evolutionary roots of the things we call morality and ethics. There's no God that just gave us these traits. No, they evolved over time. And we earned them, you might say, through the force of natural selection for survival purposes. I urge you all to do some study of natural selection independent of what your religion teaches about it. It's an amazing and beautiful process once you begin to understand it. Thank you. Well, I'd like to thank Jim for that opening statement. You'll recall that I said that there are two contentions. I would show there are good reasons to think God exists, and there are no good reasons to think atheism is true. And let's see how Jim has done in those areas. First, Jim said, well, yeah, God exists. He's in all of our minds. Well, Jim, I think what you mean is the idea of God exists. And I'll grant you, of course, the idea exists, just as the idea of Santa Claus or the idea of dragons exist. What we're debating is, does this idea correspond to something that really exists? Jim asked us to imagine when humans didn't exist. Where is God in the Jurassic Age? He's nowhere around because there are no humans. But think about this, during the Jurassic Age, did the multiplication table exist? Did Maxwell's equations exist? Did the theory of relativity exist? Well, certainly, because there are objects and other things that exist independently of human minds that have an objective reality, and God is one of those things. He's just a mind that transcends time, space, matter, and energy. So even if there aren't humans to perceive him, he is there. Yes, the tree falling in the woods does make a sound if you're not around to hear it. Number two, Jim's entire argument tonight has been built on a massive fallacy, and that fallacy is called the genetic fallacy. What that means is the genetic fallacy occurs when you say that a belief is false just because the person arrived at it in an irrational way. For example, take Lucy. Let's say Lucy is an atheist because she was raised by atheist parents who indoctrinated her and kept on a vegan diet so she lacked protein and her brain didn't fully evolve. So she didn't have the right tools to analyze the arguments, therefore God exists. Well, 
that doesn't prove anything. Just because you, let's say you're an atheist because you don't want God to exist, like the philosopher Thomas Nagel. That wouldn't show theism is true, it just shows you don't have a good foundation for your belief. So the reasons that Jim gave dealing with hyperactive agency detection and that evolution has programmed us to find God, those are really irrelevant to tonight. As, as the skeptic Michael Shermer says in his book, The Believing Brain, he says, even if our brains are programmed to seek out God, the question still remains, does God exist? Your brain may be programmed to find that snake in the grass, but I tell you, it either is there or isn't. So you, we need serious arguments to examine if this God does exist. Jim said, well, evolution's programmed us to uh, say that church and everything, that we've projected family onto these, this anthropomorphisms. I would say, though, that if God exists, he's designed us to be ordered towards family, and we see this. Even atheists are guilty of anthropomorphism. They sometimes say that we should protect the environment because of all the earth has done for us. Well, that, that's just a projection. The earth is an inanimate object. And I'm not going to get into it, let this debate get into anything about the anthropomorphic uh, issues in the Bible. This debate isn't about biblical inerrancy. It's about whether God exists at all. Jim made an interesting argument about other people's minds, and I think his main argument tonight is going to work against that. He said that we've learned to identify other people's minds through evolution, that we have to assume other people have minds in order to get along and survive with one another. But think about that. What if I made the argument that uh, any, everyone you see around you does not have a mind? Because think about it, your brain was programmed to find minds in other people for your survival. So since evolution's programmed you with hyperactive agency detection, and you can't empirically see other people have minds, you only see behave, mind-like behaviors, it follows no one else has a mind. But that certainly doesn't follow at all. And in fact, if God exists, that would make sense that humans have minds because they're made in God's image. Number seven, Jim says that in our brains, the, the same regions light up when we think about God and when we think about the intentions of other people. But that is exactly what we would expect if God exists, because God is a person and he has intentions. So we'd probably wonder, well, what would God want me to do? Does he want me to fill out my taxes? Does he want me to worship him? Does he want me to cheat on my wife? If we're trying to figure out God's will, then that area of the brain will light up because God's a person who has intentions for us. Now, Jim said that God's emotions are just an anthropomorphic projection, that, oh, we need God to be there, and so we say he's jealous and needs us to worship him. Well, and he says, well, God, this conception of God, he's jealous, insufficient. Why would he need us? And I agree that God doesn't need us. We need God. When God says to obey him, he doesn't do it in an egomaniacal way. Because he's the source of perfect goodness, he is the greatest being possible. He has no deficiencies. He's perfect goodness of what it is. He knows it is best for us to follow him because he's infinitely smarter, more loving, and kinder than we are. So worship for God isn't for his sake, it's for our sake. That worship means to give someone their worth's ship. And to say that God doesn't deserve it and we should get all the credit when he's the infinitely perfect being, omniscient, all-powerful, perfectly good, all-loving, kind, and just, that would be egomaniacal on our ends to deny just the matter of fact that I should probably respect this being. I mean, we all respect police officers when they pull us over, and they only have a mildly more power than we do. So I, I think we should probably respect God, not out of his power, but the fact that he is perfect goodness himself. He is being itself, and without him, we would not be here. And my, I think my arguments have demonstrated that. Jim says that animals exhibit moral behaviors too. But I will say that animals only exhibit uh, evolutionarily dis disposed altruistic behaviors. Animals literally ascribe to the idea that you scratch my back, I scratch yours. And maybe pick out a few fleas while I'm there. Hopefully you're not doing that with anyone here. But Jim made an interesting point. He said, well, this explains things because there are no moral facts, and people are just predisposed to find their own morality. I would disagree. I would just say that we should not, uh, I think these moral facts are self-evident, that it just is a fact it's wrong to rape women. Even if you evolved in a society that said it was useful or good, it would still be wrong. Uh, you know, killing uh, innocent children just because you find joy in it, that's just a fact that it's wrong. 
And even though people disagree about moral facts, people disagree about, the, about empirical facts too, like uh, different scientific facts, but that wouldn't cause us to doubt what really exists. So I would say that Jim has given no arguments to show that atheism is true, has failed to refute my arguments, and that the rational person is still justified in believing that God exists. Okay. First of all, Brett makes a lot of statements that actually prove my point about God. He, he makes many statements that say, God wants this, and God wants this, and God is this way, and God has these desires, and, the, and these ideas. It, this, this is making my point that, how does he know that? Who told him that? Does God speak to him? This, again, is what we see in uh, when people talk about God, if you look at ev <clears throat> excuse me, evangelical Christians on TV, they all seem to know what God wants. How is that? Do, does God speak to all of them, but he hasn't spoken to me? Has he spoken to anyone in, in this audience directly? Can you write down what he said? D directly uh, shows the, um, excuse me, the... Uh, the theory of mind concept. Okay, so what would convince me that there's a God? Well, God appeared to Thomas, God appeared to Paul. Why only those two people? Why, why doesn't he appear to everybody? And then he, we can end this big cat and mouse game about, well, does he exist or doesn't he exist? And all the pain and anguish and worry and mental energy and emotion that goes into all of that. Why doesn't he just tell us? Philosophical arguments that Trent has tried to present are age-old arguments. And they're not simple arguments. They're extremely complicated arguments. And they're, and they're very old. The cosmological argument dates back to Socrates, Plato, and Aristotle, and actually before them. That's 2,500 years ago. The uh, Anselm's argument, the ontological argument, dates back 1,000 years. These are great thinkers. These were, were fantastic men. The fact that we still talk about them today and still argue about their ideas shows that they were great thinkers. But they did not have the benefit of all of the information that we've accumulated as human beings up to this point. We have a tremendous amount of scientific knowledge now, discovering the cos cosmos, discovering down into the deepest parts of matter. And for us, I, and I, I can speak for Trent here, because I'm not qualified to argue these physics arguments. They are very complicated, deep arguments. And, and I know he's not a physicist. So we're just touching the surface of those arguments. And those are not arguments that bring people to a belief or send people away from a belief in any kind of a, a deity. These are arguments that are, that are for philosophers and physicists. And over when they make a discovery like that, these arguments trickle down to us 10, 15, or 20 years later, if we're lucky. I'm going to concentrate mostly on the moral argument, what my presentation ended with. I did not say that the behavior observed in primates is moral behavior. And none of the primatologists say that either. But it is the building blocks, just the building blocks, the beginnings of a type of moral behavior. And you have to admit to yourself that in the society we live in, there is murder, there is killing, 
There, children do get tortured, and we do have war. If these things are morally objective, then why do we have them? And I need to, I need to define these terms, because whenever I hear these, this objective moral value argument, that term is thrown out there without any definition. Definition of objective, of or having to do with a material object as distinguished from a mental concept, idea, or belief. Second definition of that is having actual existence or reality. Third definition of objective, uninfluenced by emotion, surmise, or personal prejudice of or having to do with a material object. Does, if murder exists, if killing exists in this world, then it's, it's not objectively morally wrong. For it to be objectively morally wrong, it would have to not exist in the world. It would have to have physical reality in the world. Morals are relative. We see that different cultures have different moral values. Now, this is usually defined as a relativistic moral viewpoint, and so it is. However, in addition to that, when something is wrong in a society, people get together who think it's wrong, and they fight against it. We had slavery in this country for many, many years. Even the founding fathers, many, many of whom were Christians, owned slaves. Slavery was an accepted institution. Eventually, people got together and they did away with slavery in this country. Unfortunately, slavery still exists in the world. My point on the objective moral value is simply that by definition, if it's objective, it must have physical reality in the world. So either we need a new term to describe it, or it doesn't exist objectively in the world. Let's examine those arguments that I presented for the existence of God. Remember, I presented arguments from the beginning of the universe, the fact that it's fine-tuned and that that tuning can't be explained by chance or necessity and is only adequately explained by design. And we have evidence God has revealed himself through the supernatural resurrection of Jesus. And Jim has not chosen to respond to any of those arguments, so I think we can conclude there is a creator and designer of the universe who's raised a man from the dead. Now we have to figure out, is this creator and designer of the universe who's raised a man from the dead, which if you're an atheist and you believe in that, that's a strange form of atheism, is he the source of moral goodness? Let's look at some of the things that Jim brought up. He said that I made assertions about God. Not at all. I made rational inferences that if God exists, then if he sustains everything, nothing can be lacking about him. If he were a created being, he would have deficiencies. But since he's the, he sustains all existence, there can be nothing deficient about him. And a priori, that would deserve our, our worth it, worship or respect. Also, that if Jesus has been resurrected from the dead, which my argument went unchallenged, uh, Jesus said we should love God. And if a man can walk out of his own tomb, what he says, that's good enough for me. So who, is, who has God spoken to? Well, I don't think he speaks to me directly. I believe in a public revelation. And if Jesus rose from the dead and particularly founded one church to give the deposit of faith to, and Jim hasn't presented an argument to say that's false, then we can be confident in resurrection. I'm sorry, in God's revelation. Why isn't God more obvious? Well, I think that if God made his existence obvious, it would compromise our moral freedom. Our decision to follow God, if he made his existence obvious, would be no more free than your decision to travel the speed limit when a police officer is following behind you. God wants us to, be, to cultivate virtue and be like him, and I think he has revealed himself in nature and conscience. In Romans 2, 14 through 16, God, uh, St. Paul says that God has revealed himself to people's consciences so those who don't know the law can know God. 
He said, well, these arguments for God are really old. Well, it doesn't mean they're false. Just because something is old doesn't mean it's wrong or false. If you doubt that, ask your grandparents. Uh, I mean, atheism is old as well, but that doesn't mean that it's false. And um, so Jim is focused mostly on the moral argument, and I think he's, he's doing a double speak. He's saying, well, there are no moral facts, but at the same time, he said, uh, it's unfortunate we didn't outlaw slavery faster. But think about this. If there are no moral facts, then the decision to end slavery is just as trivial as the decision for men to stop wearing coats and hats. If there are no moral facts as a standard to judge societies, you can't say one society gets better or worse. You can only say that it gets different. That's why Martin Luther King Jr. in his letter from a Birmingham jail said that a law is unjust if it does not correspond with the moral law or the law of God. So if moral relativism is true, people like Dr. King are always wrong because society always outnumbers them. But I think that moral facts do exist, that in the natural world, when you see a primate forcibly copulate with another primate, we call that mating. Now, if moral facts don't exist and you saw a human primate do that with another human primate, you'd have to call it uh, mating as well, but we don't, we call it rape. So, Jim's definition of objective is just wrong. He says objective things have to be material, but mathematic and scientific truths are not material, but they are objective. And I agree that moral facts have existence, and they're, they're uninfluenced. Jim has confused objectivity with universality. When I say morals are objective, I don't mean everyone believes them. I'm saying that they are facts that are true regardless if people disagree. When I say rape, oh, am I, am I done? Well, thank you very much. <laughs> I haven't confused the, the word objective. I looked it up in the dictionary, wrote it down, and then read it to you. The word objective means what it means. Now, if, if there's another definition of that, I'd like to hear it. It's the, the definition says that the thing has to exist in reality. It has to exist. Physical reality, that's what it says. <clears throat> uh, once again, I heard Trent uh, make a lot of statements about what God wants and what he knows, and he seems to know what God wants in several of these statements. Uh, he's also referring to uh, the, the Bible a lot. Uh, Jesus was resurrected, uh, Revelation. <laughs> these stories are only from the Bible. There's only one book, one source, for all of these stories, and it's the Bible. Jesus rose from the dead. It only comes from the Bible. There are no historical, alternate historical accounts of that. Josephus, he mentions Josephus, one historian mentions Christ, not Jesus. He mentions the word Christ. Christ is a title, like today we have Mr. or Mrs. Christ was like a Respe very respectful title for people back in those days. So these, the, uh, these stories only have one source. Now, if there were multiple sources, if there were multiple historians at that time who had, who had their writings here today, I mean, we know more about the pharaohs from 6,000 years ago, 8,000 years ago. We know more about people on the uh, hunter-gatherer groups, little small hunter-gatherer groups, 10, 12, and 15,000 years ago than we do about Jesus Christ. And he was only 2,000 years ago. There are so many inerrancies in the Bible. Now, Trent said earlier that I, I mentioned the Bible and I shouldn't have mentioned it, but he's been mentioning it quite a bit, so I'm hoping that I'm allowed to mention it now. But there are so many inconsistencies and inerrancies in the Bible. Uh, there were 40 years in the desert. Uh, that's dated about 13th century BC. That's the Israelites spent 40, I'm sorry, 40 years in the desert. No archaeological evidence for that, none whatsoever. And believe me, Jewish historians have been, uh, archaeologists, paleontologists, have been searching the desert for evidence of the 40 years that the Israelites supposedly spent there. 
supposed to be several hundred thousand people. Even if you reduce that to maybe 20,000. No campsites, no settlements, nothing earlier than the 10th century. Okay? Uh, the Battle of Canaan, no evidence, no historical evidence for the Battle of Canaan, none whatsoever. A golden age of Israel and Judea, 1000 BC. It's only 3,000 years ago. No evidence for that at all. What else? The Bible conflicts with many known scientific facts today. Why aren't these things in the Bible? Why isn't the age of the universe in the Bible? Why didn't God tell us the age of the universe, the age of the earth? Why didn't he tell us about disease or technology? How come he didn't give us any of these things in the Bible? How to build a car, a computer. Uh, if, <clears throat> if it was written by God, if the Bible was written by God, why is the earth, uh, why did we believe that the earth was flat at the center of the universe and that the sun goes around the earth all of those years? We had to discover that way, much later on. The, the arguments that I said were old, they are old. They're good arguments, they're very good arguments, but these thinkers did not have the information we have today. Thank you, I'm out of time. You wanna take the mic? You wanna take your mic for Cross? What we're gonna do now is we're gonna take a, a brief opportunity to have them do some cross-examination with one another. But at this time, I'd like if you have any questions that you'd like to uh, have me read to the speakers, I'm gonna go through those questions and try and sort out um, what I think are the best ones for the debate. So take them and put them towards the center and Destiny is gonna pick those up. Um, so take just a second to do that and then I'm gonna I'm going to start the uh, cross-examination with uh, Trent, who's going to cross-examine Jim, okay? All right, right, let's. I got a few questions here. Uh, Jim, is it possible that, for, is it possible for the Bible to have errors in it and for God to still exist? Yes, it is, but not, but, but you can't use the Bible then to, and say it was written by that perfect being, that all perfect, all knowing being. It, it doesn't work. Oh, no, I would agree with you that, um, but yeah, that would be begging the question to say that God exists because the Bible says so and the Bible's right because God made it. Definitely that's begging the question. But I only used the Bible to affirm Jesus and I said it wasn't made by God. It could have true and false things. So on the question of Jesus, you said that uh, Josephus only mentions Christ. Uh, have you read the two passages in the antiquities that refer to Jesus? You haven't read them. So how do you know it only mentions Christ and it doesn't say uh, there was a wise man named Jesus who performed many strange and startling things and he was uh, brought up to be killed by the leading men among us under Pontius Pilate and the tribe of Christians to this day still is exists. So you're confident that Christ isn't mentioned in there even though you haven't read it. Where is that? It's in book 18 of the Antiquities, and in book 20 of Josephus's Antiquities, he mentions James, the brother of Jesus, who was called the Christ. Okay, well, I, I will learn that, uh, but I'm not aware of it, no. I okay. Um, let's try a little bit. You said um, that the Bible is one book, uh, so you would disagree with all New Testament scholars who believe the New Testament is a collection of books written over many different decades and compiled later. Do you think it's a compilation of books or the New Testament is actually only one book authored by one person? No, it's a compilation of books. A compilation of books. So if it's a compilation of books then and letters, wouldn't we have multiple sources to Jesus, not just one? No, not at all. These books have been written long after Jesus lived. There were no eyewitness accounts and no historical accounts. And, and to have all of those accounts in that book, in that one source, does not make it many, many sources. These books were written from 50 to 300 years after Jesus Christ supposedly lived. Uh, what source do you have to back up the 50 and 300 year number? I've read, read about it. I've read many books about it. Uh, I can't cite a specific source right now, but anyone in this room can look it up on the internet. You can research that. 
All of these books were written long after Jesus. Lives. One last question. Lived. Yeah, if okay. society changed to make slavery moral again, would it be good or would it still be evil, even though most people think it's... If most people thought it was good, would slavery become good or would it still be evil? Well, you're still talking from an objective moral viewpoint. It's, it's not good or bad, but if it exists at the time, there are people that agree with it and people that disagree with it. And what eventually happens is that that behavior is rooted out of society because of a greater amount of approval or disapproval from the group of people. And you all see that that's how our society is. We do not see objective morality. We see a selective morality. I guess we're out of time, so it's your turn. Uh, that was seven minutes? It flies. Do you believe in evolution? Trent? Yes, I do. Okay. And it's also the position of the Catholic Church. And in 2004, the International Theological Commission by the Church affirmed with Cardinal Ratzinger, the current pope, saying that it's highly plausible that life evolved and that that came from the Big Bang. Okay. And um, we have souls. You believe we have a soul? Uh, I believe that everyone here is not just a molecular machine, that there are immaterial aspects of them. So did God give us a soul at some point during this evolutionary process? When, I mean, that, that's... When, when, did he, when did the soul come into existence in our bodies or material thing? Well, I don't think it's implausible to think that God uh, gave the ability for early hominids. Francis Collins, for example, is the head of the National Institute for Health. He mapped the entire human genome project. And so he knows genetics very well. He sees no problem in thinking that somewhere from 10,000 to 100,000 years ago, based on hominids' ability to develop moral sense and rational awareness, God gave people souls. But even if human beings did not have souls, God could still exist. For example, the philosopher Peter Vanenwagen at the University of Notre Dame is a materialist. He thinks humans are just material objects that God can resurrect. He doesn't believe in souls, but... God still exists, so I, I don't think it's really relevant. He also uh, fell down on his knees and believed in God when he saw a three uh, frozen waterfall that had You're three... You're talking about Francis Collins? Yeah. So he seems to be pretty susceptible to that belief. Okay. Um, and w are we designed by God? Uh, I mean, has he designed us the way we are? Or, I, th or... I think that human beings are naturally oriented towards being made in God's image, and in particular, identifying moral truths. That's why we have a sense of outrage at moral wrongs, even if a majority of people think that they're right. And I would just disagree with you that morals can be objective and not universal. For example, it's objective that the Holocaust happened and we landed on the moon, even though such belief isn't what I, universal. What I meant, Trent, was did he design us, physically design us? Are we designed by God in his image? Well, and if so, okay. if so, why are we so poorly designed? What, what, do you mean, what do you mean by design? That he put us together like Legos? Yeah, yeah, basically. Well, if he, if he evolved... If, well, let's if finish, we might be out of time. If he set up evo evolution and we evolved this way, why, why, are we, why do we have pain? And why, are, you know, why do we, are we so fragile? And we're susceptible to disease? Uh, what, what is this design? This is a very poor design by a, a great and all-powerful being. Uh, I just don't get it. Well, I think we would have to ask, what are God's purposes in his designs? And I think from Revelation that I have grounds to believe in that, because I think I showed Jesus rose from the dead and that wasn't challenged, that God desires us to follow him, and that God's purpose is not to, make, to hook us up to pleasure well, machines. You, you didn't, you didn't uh, uh, prove that Jesus rose from the dead. Well, it wasn't disproven. You, asser you asserted, you say with words, you said that Jesus rose from the dead. You didn't prove it. Well, I think that an argument is a sound one if the premises are true and there's valid reasoning and you haven't shown, in three out of four of my arguments, well, I think actually all four, you haven't shown any of the premises to be false or they're invalid reasoning. So I think they what, succeed. What is the proof then for Jesus? Where, I, haven't, I don't see any proof. You have asserted it. Out of the Bible, which says it, that's the only place that says it, 
but there is no physical proof of any kind. Uh, how, do you, how do you assert that you have proved it? I was not asserting anything. I used a pattern of reasoning called inference to the best explanation. That's not proof. That's reasoning. So if you went outside and saw that your car had been destroyed and your stereo was taken out, in or you would probably arrive at the conclusion that somebody broke into your car and stole things, right? Of course, but that's not... I'm how, how did you get you to that belief? I'm specifically about proof. Because the car's been broken up. I didn't, you just I didn't do it, and, and God didn't do it because he doesn't exist. How is Jesus proven to have risen from the dead? What I gave were a series of facts, and historians do this. Not facts, I'm sorry. Well, I gave evidence for them, and you didn't disprove the evidence, so I think we can believe there is their facts. No, what evidence? What is the evidence? Well, I keep gave... saying that there's evidence, but I haven't seen any. Has anyone here seen evidence? Physical proof that there is that Jesus rose from the dead. Do you have any evidence that uh, Julius Caesar crossed the Rubicon that's here with us right now? There's a tremendous amount of historical evidence. Like what? For that. Books. Books that have been written. Historical books that are here <laughs> all over the place. So, Jim, you're willing to say that one book can be trusted and not another, but in fact, in many... There are many books, Trent, that, uh -huh. that have historical evidence for Julius Caesar, but, not, but there's only one book that asserts that Jesus Christ rose from the dead, a physical reality that no one here has ever heard of anywhere else, Okay. ever in history. Okay, but if it's a singular event, what I said was I'm making an inference to the best explanation. I gave good evidence. Well, well do, you, good I mean, do you think Jesus existed? No, I don't. Okay, so you're willing to go... Okay, so you're willing to go against the majority of historians. In fact, there are only probably five historians well, in the, the world. The majority of historians don't absolutely 100% believe that Jesus Christ existed. Okay, there is perhaps a consensus among some historians that believe that, and then a consensus among a whole bunch of other historians that don't believe that. What historians can you cite that uh, believe Jesus did not exist? Well, uh, I, I, can't, I can't cite one off the top of my head, but there are many, many books that, that you know, historical documents, historians that do, have not written about Jesus. What, there were many historians at the time of Jesus, many that lived at that time. Like who? They, and none of them. There are no other historical... If, if there was any historian that lived at the time of Jesus Christ that had written about him, he would be known today. He would be the second book next to the Bible that would offer proof of Jesus Christ's existence at that time. And there is not one, and that's why I don't know of any, because I'm not going to read historians that have not written about him. But what I would recommend that you read a book. Bart Ehrman is an agnostic scholar. He writes a book criticizing Christianity, but he's written a recent book called Did Jesus Exist? And Ehrman says in that book that even though many historians, including non-Christians, have different views about Jesus, many of them think Jesus was just an eccentric prophet, they all agree that Jesus did exist. And I only can only think of less than five on my hand that doubt that. Richard Carrier, Robert Price. Okay, well, I guess we're out of time. Very good. Very good. But it's 99% to 1. Okay, well, I had a chance to look at the questions that were offered from the audience, and apparently you guys are all thinking very carefully about this, and you've got a bunch of tough questions. And so I'm going to try and give a question to each of our five questions to each of our participants. They'll have a couple of minutes to respond, and then if they wish, uh, the person on the other side can respond as well. And I'll start with the affirmative side with Trent. Um, this questioner, uh, I think, is asking about some of your claims about the perfection. Actually, talking about a story from the Hebrew Bible where God commands that the Israelites slaughter the Amalekites, uh, men, women, and children. God, I guess I'm kind of putting words in the mouth of the questioner here. If God is the source of morality, then why would he ask the Israelites to do such a uh, heinous deed? Okay, that's a good question. First, when I say God's the source of goodness, when we talk about with something's good, 
good, and, good means a perfection of being, and evil is an absence. Evil is a lack of being, similar to how cold isn't a thing, it's a lack of light, I'm sorry, a lack of heat, darkness is a lack of light. God, if he's the necessary creator of the universe and is uncreated by anyone else, he would have no deficiencies. And my moral argument, I think, shows that we see some things are really good and evil and they, they have to flow from somewhere, and that'd be God's perfect nature. Now to the Old Testament, a few points. One, let's say that all of it was true and that God ordered this and it was immoral. That would not prove that God did not exist. It would not prove that the resurrection did not happen. All that would prove were those, that those things, those events, did not happen. They were just exaggerations in the Old Testament. So that objection would not disprove the case that I've made tonight. Number two, God has sovereignty over our lives. He creates us, and I think it's a good thing we're not, we don't live eternal lives here on earth. We get bored pretty quick. God ends our lives, and then we have an eternal existence after that. So God ends people's lives all the time. I don't think that that's wrong. And if he ended the Amalekites' lives, I don't think that that's wrong. Plus, in Deuteronomy 25, verse 17, the Amalekites were the aggressors. They purposefully attacked the weak and the elderly of Israel after they left Egypt. So they started this campaign of terror. And finally, there are many Old Testament scholars who say the commands to kill women and children are ancient Near East exaggerations. Similar to when we say our team slaughtered them on the basketball court. We don't think it's splattered with blood. Because the book of Judges describes the driving out of the Canaanites uh, as just driving them out and smashing idols. So I think a good case can be made that the book of Joshua, where the Amalekites are described, that's epic narration that uses exaggeration. And if God did command it, he's a source of morality. Uh, as far as the Canaanites go, I'm going to bring up a very uh, nasty subject here, and I hope I can get, a, get it done in a minute. Uh, William Lane Craig uh, has addressed the issue of the Canaanites, and he says that the, it was okay to kill the adults because they were just bad. And, uh, and it was okay to kill the kids because uh, by killing the children, you're sending them back to God. That was, that was his reasoning. In addition to that, if they didn't kill the children, and they brought the children home with them, and then those children grew up and mated with the Israelite children, that would create an impurity in their race. And when was the last time anybody can remember discussions about purity of race? That is, I find that explanation by William Lane Craig, one of the, one of the world's leading apologists, to be disgusting, to condone the killing of children, and then, well, enough said. Okay. Um, actually, Jim, you're on the spot now. Uh, and this questioner has a, a curiosity about your statements about morality being relative. Ask, so Jim, you don't believe that slavery and the torturing of children and the raping of women is objectively wrong, but rather it's just relative? Well, I'm afraid that that is what we see. That is the societies that we live in. All cultures are different. I personally believe that all of those things are wrong, and I would die trying to stop them. But unfortunately, the world we live in, the people that we are, the, the biological beings that we are, that's what we see. We see it all around us. It is good, it's good to have those values. We all in this room agree that those values are good. To kill is wrong. Everybody here agrees that, with that, I'm sure. But we don't see that in our society. We don't see that in the world we live in. That that is objectively true. By definition, objective means it must exist in the world. It must be a reality in the world. And that's not what we see. If you study natural selection, if you study evolution, you see that the building blocks of morality, of right and wrong, have come down and evolved for millions of years till we are the moral beings that we are now. But we do not see objectivity of morality in our society, in our race as it is now. I would just say that that is a highly dangerous opinion to hold that morality is objective because we all agree on it. 
Well, if that's the case, then Germany in 1845, it was good. I mean, it was, you know, evil to kill Jews, gypsies, and homosexuals. But later in 1945, uh, it becomes good. And if it's relative to culture, then they're both equally right. But that sounds absurd. We believe that cultures are just groups of individuals. And if a person can be wrong about morality, so can a culture. And what I think this moral, relative, moral relativism is going to cut against you, Jim, because if you're saying morals are relative, then the Israelites, when they slaughtered the Amalekites, they had a shared value that was right. So on what standard can you say they were wrong? I can't say that. Uh, uh, oh. Okay, sorry. <laughs> okay, um, moving away from morality briefly and back to Trent, um, one of the questioners is actually wants to get at um, the cosmological argument, roughly, says that all things have to have a cause. Then, doesn't it logically imply that the positing as the source of all things, God also have to have a cause? Well, what I would disagree with that statement is I think it's false that everything has to have a cause. I don't believe that, and I don't know any... Christian, Jewish, or Muslim theologians that do believe that. My argument was not that everything has a cause. It was everything that begins to exist has a cause for its existence. And I gave three lines of evidence, one philosophical and two scientific, to show that the universe did begin to exist. And if it began to exist, it would need a cause outside of it. Now remember, the universe is all space, time, matter, and energy. This cause can't be material because it made space. It's got to be eternal because it made time, and it had to be very, very powerful. And it would have to be a mind because it's choosing to make a finite universe like ours as opposed to just a mindless eternal force spawning an eternal universe. So you're correct. That argument would be false because the first premise is wrong. I don't think everything needs a cause. But if something begins to exist, being can't come from non-being without a cause. And if the universe came into existence, I think that that's a fact that we have to see that it needs a cause, and we do an analysis, what does that mean? Uh, these arguments are just, they just go around in circles, these, these ancient age-old arguments. Uh, cause schmoz, uh, if you'll excuse the expression. There are, there is no reason whether there was a cause or there wasn't a cause. There's no reason to believe that God was the cause. There could be many other explanations. At one time, there, there's many things that we did not know and we now know to be true or to be different from what we thought. And to just assert that God is the reason, God is the cause, just is a dead end. It, it doesn't go anywhere. It doesn't, it doesn't uh, allow for a continuation of exploration of the world, of the universe, of ourselves. So I just, I, I, I just don't want to really deal with these arguments anymore. There's so much more information in the world now than these cosmological, ontological, teleological arguments. They're, they're, they were great at the time, but their time has passed, and they don't accomplish anything. Okay. Um, back to Jim now, and this has to do with a, a questioner that was wondering about your dictionary definition of objectivity as having material existence. And Trent responded, and I guess the questioner wonders what you have to say about this, that if you say that something objective has to be material, then what do you have to say about mathematics, which seems to have objective truth without having a material basis? Very, very good question. And I'm really not sure how to answer that, but the word objective means what it means. I, if anybody here has, a, has a, a phone, they can look it up on the internet. Uh, what is the definition of objective? If it says that it must have physical reality. Now, the, the term objective, moral, value, that term if you put those words together, they have to have meaning by definition of what those words mean, what the definition of those words are. And that's what I'm going by. So, 
mathematics, you can say it existed before human beings were here. That's possible. And then human beings come along and we discover it because it's already here. It's, it, you know, I, I really, I'm, I'm at a loss to answer that question because, yes, they, that is objective. It is objective that one, and one, one plus one is two. But, but it also, that has meaning in physical reality when you apply the numbers to things. That, and that's what we do, so. Well, I would just say one plus one would equal two, even if there was just a Big Bang singularity and there were no objects, it wouldn't become false. And my only response to this, considering objective, I just find it really odd that you're making fun of me for considering the Bible infallible, but you seem to think the dictionary is infallible. I'm just going by definition, Trent. All hail Webster. I'm just, I'm just going by the definition of the word. If you want to use terms, then you got to define the terms. And the Bible, you know, has, there's, there's the only book that says the things that it says. Okay? It's the only book that says that. Okay, we're going to move on to Trent here. And this goes back to the moral issue that is part of your early argument. The questioner asks, um, if morality comes from God then how do you explain the fact that there are people that are born with personality disorders that um, cause them to have a lack of empathy and compassion? Uh, if morality comes from God, why do some people seem predisposed to not have it? Okay, we need to separate when we talk about morality, moral ontology and moral epistemology. What that means, moral epistemology, is how we know moral truths. How do you know what's good and evil, right or wrong? Ontology is what makes moral facts true. And I think that moral facts can only be true if they're immaterial facts that exist and compel us to act a certain way. They have to come from an eternal, immaterial source. So when we look, though, uh, at the issue of moral facts, that people, yes, they disagree about morality, and some people seem predisposed to not act morally. But that's an issue of epistemology, how we know morals. Morals can still be objective, even if some people disagree, or if they are genetically predisposed to not know them. For example, I think I'm genetically predisposed to be bad at math, but math is still objective. Or some people have uh, brain disorders called prospignosia, they believe there are, there's no objective difference between people's faces. So they have a brain disorder that keeps them from seeing objective reality. But certainly people have different faces even if they can't recognize it. So a psychopath who can't recognize moral facts, they're just simply mistaken. They're as mistaken as the man who thinks two plus two equals five, or the man who thinks the earth is flat. Comes back to the brain, the evolved brain. And in psychopaths and sociopaths, there is definitely a distinctive difference in the brain. The epistemological information and the ontological information doesn't help the situation. But when you look at the biological problem that, that, that a person like that has, and you apply that physically to the world and, and come up with real world answers, that's what's important. The esoteric arguments don't help that person and don't help society. All right, then we're back to Jim. And uh, this questioner is curious about um, some of the scientific explanations for cosmology that you referenced, right? Um, it being true that matter cannot be created or destroyed, um, do you have any kind of uh, non-supernatural explanation for the existence of matter. No. And neither do any of the eminent physicists that are on the cutting edge of physics today. There are lots of theories. I'm not a physicist. I can't answer these questions. Brent's not a physicist either, and he can't, he can't answer these questions. So no. There are, there are, but there are lots of theories about matter coming into existence. Lots of them. Go look them up. 
Well, I would say there are lots, there are different theories or models related to the universe, but if you do a survey of cosmology, there is still one model that's called the standard model, and that would be the universe originating from a Big Bang. And I showed with the bord vilenkin gu theorem that the universe, even if it's a multiverse, has to come from an additional singularity. And Vilenkin has reaffirmed this in a 2012 article you can read in Scientific American, or you can search and read his paper online with graduate student Audrey Mathani. So I think, yeah, there are different, maybe there are different theories, but so what? I mean, there's different theories about where life came from, evolution and creationism. I think creationism is false. So I think these other theories that try to explain the universe, like saying it's eternal, it contradicts facts we know. Entropy buildup, we're not at maximum entropy. It contradicts the philosophical argument I gave that the universe can't be eternal. And it contradicts the fact that the Big Bang model explains so much about our universe. Now you're right, physicists can't prove God. They deal with physical facts. So what most physicists could show was that the universe had an absolute beginning at some point. What caused that? Well now the cause is outside of, of nature. And science can only examine repeatable events in nature Metaphysicians have to do God. Physicists can't prove any of it. They, they just have theories. Okay. Um, we're now we're back to Trent. We've got um, one more distinct question apiece, and then I've actually got a really good question from the audience that is going to work for both of you. So um, let's um, have Trent work with this one. And I think that uh, the questioner is trying to uh, get you to comment on the gods of other religions because they say, would the theist consider himself an atheist towards the god of the Quran, for example? Or I would, ex I would expect that they would probably also say the gods of the Hindu tradition or the Chinese tradition. Why or why not? I would say that I am no more an atheist because I deny some other gods exist than I am an anarchist because I deny some other governments are the best models. So just because I reject some gods as being incoherent or lacking in evidence, how would that follow there isn't one god that actually fits the bill? Much the same way, we all probably reject lots of forms of government. We don't believe in dictatorships or oligarchies or things like that, but that doesn't make us anarchists. We just think, no, there's one form of government that makes the most sense. And I think that there's one form of god that makes the most sense that my arguments point to. I don't believe in these other gods because many of them are completely incoherent. Uh, for example, the, the god of the Quran, Allah, I think there are certain traits in him that are contradictory. For example, he's a god of love, but in the Quran it says explicitly God hates certain people. And nothing like that can be remotely found in the Bible. Plus, I don't think there's good evidence that the Quran is the inspired word of God because the only arguments Muslims give for the Quran is that in Arabic it sounds really nice and it predicts scientific facts. But I think both of those are demonstrably false. I've appealed to arguments for God from science and morality, and especially the arguments from science. I just think, Jim, that if you're a free thinker, shouldn't you follow where the science leads and engage the science I've brought here tonight? I haven't seen any science. I've, seen, I've heard lots of arguments that are old arguments, that are circular arguments, that do nothing to prove the existence or non-existence of God. Uh, none, none of those arguments. The idea that there are other religions and, and uh, you know, other gods, yeah, there's been thousands of other gods throughout history, thousands of religions that are now defunct and gone, many that we don't even know about, that, are, that, are, that have these crazy ideas about the beginning of the universe. That alone, that right there, should make one question how anyone knows that the one thing, the one God, the one religion, this is the one. This is the only one. Religions are fighting everywhere. Everywhere around the world. Strife. War. Why? Religion. Ireland. The Mideast. Uh, um, what is it? Uh, former Yugoslavia. All of these places. Uh, uh, Africa. South America. Everywhere. Oh, sorry. <laughs> okay. Finally, um, Jim, um, by a strictly materialist and atheist stance, humans are really just biological machines in a way. If that's the case, how do you account, in, from your perspective, for our consciousness and our unique ability to perceive 
and to experience reality. So you want me to answer question, a question that nobody else on the planet can answer. What's the nature of consciousness? Well, um, it's all up here. It's all right here. We have evolved. I don't know why, we, but we have. We're here. We think. We have a subconscious that takes care of 90% of the things that we're, we're about. We can think of four or five different things at the same time. We can talk to one person while listening to a, a conversation across uh, at another table. We can, we can uh, watch, have the TV on, have the radio on, be working on our computer. What's the nature of consciousness? That's not a question that I certainly can answer. But it's a wonderful thing. It's, a, it's, a, it's an incredible thing to ponder. And why, why would I want to think that some god that I have no evidence, no proof for whatsoever, doesn't appear at all in my life, gave me this thing, just gave it to me, and now I have it. Doesn't make any sense to me. Well, I would say that consciousness, we are aware of certain facts related to it that makes it an incredibly wonderful and yet confusing thing. That we can have mental states that don't seem to be identical to our brain states. That a blind person can know every fact about color, for example. But our minds can represent color in a way that no fact ever can. And that seems to show that these kind of facts are immaterial. But if you accept an atheistic worldview, you seem tied to materialism, which I think is false. You also seem to have to be tied to the idea that there is no such thing as free will. Because if it's only your brain, then your choice to do anything is about as free as a Dr. Pepper can's choice to fizz a bunch when you open it. So I think the fact that we have free will, mental states that represent things, even Alex Rosenberg and his guy, Atheist Guide to Reality says that consciousness is so strange that being an atheist, he thinks it has to be an illusion. Because if it really did exist, then God must exist. Okay, um, finally, and this goes to both of you, and I'll let Trent answer first and then Jim uh, finish up. The questioner asks, hypothetically, let's say that the outcome of this debate led to an ultimately definitive conclusion that one side won and the other side lost. And let's say that this sensibility spread, that either in your case, theism became much more prominent and atheism started die out, or in your case, atheism became much more prominent and theism just, uh, began to die out. Uh, could you both comment on what you feel would be the social implications of each one of these outcomes? I would say we have no idea what the social outcomes would be if everyone converted to atheism. On the one hand, in Nordic Europe, we seem to have very secular society. Oh, no, I thought you meant well, how to say to atheism. Well, I guess you could probably do both. Would you like both or one? Both. Okay, both. All right, let's do both. Okay. If atheism became widespread, we wouldn't be sure. It could end up like the Nordic states where we have uh, pretty well-functioning socialist countries, or maybe it could be like the Soviet Union. Richard Wormbrand, in his biography of being tortured in the gulags, describes the communist guards saying, I thank God in whom I don't believe, because now I may express the evil that is in my heart, and they rejoice in their torture. So it could be good, it could be bad. Same for theism. But I would say the social consequence of a belief does not show the belief is true or false. Evolution could lead to good things or bad things, like social Darwinism, where we leave the weak humans to die on their own. But if evolution's consequences don't relate to the truth of the theory of evolution, theism and atheism's consequences don't bear on the truth of those positions either. Well, if atheism... Uh, first of all, I, I, want, I need to say, atheism is basically, well, I don't believe in God. After that, there's a whole lot more that that does not include. So humanism, then, would be believing in humanity, in human beings, and thinking about this life here. So if the idea of humanism began to spread, that would be a good thing. So all of the mental energy and, and emotional energy 
that goes into thinking and worrying about what God is, is thinking about me and what I should do. and All of that kind of energy would go then into helping humanity. We'd be focused on each other. We'd be focused on what pain are you in that I can help with. Those are the kinds of things that I would be focused on. If theism took over the world, which it just about has, I think that there would be much more control over people, that, which is what I see religions do. They, they take over the mind and they, they want to control people. They want you to obey. God wants this. I would, see, I would see a lot more control. I'd see a lot more war, a lot more conflict, which is what we see in the world today. Again, what I said in my last response was war, there is fighting and war everywhere in the world, and much of it is because of religion. These are religious groups fighting against each other. Constant turmoil. And the other thing about that is that people who want to benefit from conflict through war, those people can more easily control people that believe in religions. Okay. Well, thanks for your... I'm going to try to tie together the threads of this debate to what we talked to what we discussed tonight. Remember I said that I would uh, propose four arguments for the existence of God and show there were no comparably, comparably good arguments for atheism. And I think that Jim hasn't, ar hasn't given any good arguments to show that God does not exist. At best, he has shown that we are predisposed through evolution to find God. But as Michael Shermer, the editor of Skeptic Magazine, says in his book, The Believing Brain, even if that were the case, there would still be the question, does God exist? Because maybe we're programmed that way because there is a divine programmer. So I think there's no other good arguments for atheism that were offered tonight. As for the arguments for theism, my arguments from the beginning of the universe, the universe is fine-tuning, and the argument from the resurrection, the premises were never challenged, nor the reasoning. So I think there's no good reason to think that they're false. Uh, Jim has sort of resorted to name-calling with the arguments, and that's really the argument to ad hominem. They're old. Okay, lots of things are old. Democracy is old. It's not a bad idea, and it's actually, I think it's true. Jim said that these arguments, well, they're, they're dead and useless, but if these arguments could quote Mark Twain, I think they would say the reports of their death are greatly exaggerated. So let's look at the argument from morality. I think that Jim has exposed the honesty of atheism, that if you believe there is no God, you can't believe in immaterial moral facts, only human opinions that change. And I think, you can correct this in your closing if you want, he even admits while he doesn't like what the Amalekites may have done in the Old Testament, he couldn't say they're wrong. He can't say that if slavery returned, it would be wrong. It would just be the new fashion. But I can say confidently, no, it is wrong. It's wrong to rape women. It's wrong to torture two-year-olds. It's wrong to tie gay college students' defenses and beat them to death. It's wrong to deny minorities the right to vote. And I don't care what other people think. And I know they're wrong because it's a fact, and it's a fact that resides in God's mind. And so God is the standard of morality, and I don't see any reason not to believe that. So here's my close. I'm nothing special. I, I make mistakes in lots of them. But you see, God, he loves us in spite of our failings, and he even wants to change our hearts to be like his. Did I get the yellow card? All right, let's keep going. Um, <laughs> it's like, did I get a penalty? So, no, <laughs> into the box. For non-Christians who are here tonight, that might sound cheesy, but an illustration may help explain what I'm talking about. In the musical Les Mis, Jean Valjean is unjustly imprisoned for 19 years, and even on parole, he can't find work. You see, he, in the play, he's taken in by a bishop, and Valjean repays him by stealing his silver utensils. Valjean is apprehended by the police and brought before the bishop for his rightful punishment. Amazingly, the bishop tells the police that he gave the silver to Valjean as a gift and even gives him more silver on the spot. After the police leave, the bishop says that Valjean must use this precious silver to become an honest man, and Valjean is torn. He had done nothing to deserve this reprieve. Why would this man that he hurt save him from his rightful punishment? 
The reason is because the man saw in Valjean what God sees in all of us. And loving Valjean as he would love his own son, the bishop gave Valjean grace, or the chance to become a new man and not be enslaved by his crimes. And this is what Christianity teaches, that no matter what sin you have committed, God desires to take away the sins of the world and grant us peace. Christ's sacrifice is not a free pass to sin. It's a free gift that turns us into the men and women we were meant to be. And so I hope you'll be moved by the evidence I presented tonight. I hope as atheists, you'll be free thinkers and consider this evidence and not write it off. And Christians, I hope you will consider the evidence Jim has presented and maybe read some books on atheism because you should examine both sides and make a rational decision that faith is uh, seeking understanding. Credo ut intelligum was the medieval philosophy. I believe in order to understand. So I believe in order to understand the world. So we all should examine both sides, and that's why I'm glad Jim was here tonight. So I hope you'll be moved by the evidence I presented. And with God's offer of grace, I know all of you know that you were meant for something. And I hope you'll take God up on that offer. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you. Uh, I'm not going to take five minutes. I just have about a two-minute closing. Uh, my, my purpose here tonight really was not to prove the non-existence of God, but to bring new information to, the, to this discussion and open, hopefully open your minds. Just, just like Trent said there at the end about reading some books different other than the Bible, and, and learning some, some new things about who we are. So uh, uh, just the last uh, couple of thoughts. I just want to say that there's a tremendous amount of research that's very new in the last five to ten years. We in the general public don't get to see this stuff for, for decades sometimes. It's very important, very interesting stuff, and we have the abil ability now to get on the Internet and, and have that information at our fingertips in a matter of moments. God is... Okay, God is not mysterious. Okay, the universe is mysterious. It's filled with wonder and awe-inspiring beauty, as well as great destructive forces. It is out of that beauty and destruction that the very matter that our bodies are, and brains are made of that we, that's where we came from. We do not need God in order to experience that beauty. We can simply stand in awe of the fact that we have the ability to experience it. Thank you. Hey, thanks for watching this video. If you want to help us produce more great content like this, be sure to click subscribe and go to trenthornpodcast.com to become a premium subscriber. You'll help us create more videos like this and get access to bonus content and sneak peeks of our upcoming projects.